Okay, it's next time. Actually, for me, it's only about 10 seconds later. I'm just going to keep reading and see. Uh, well, it's 8 o'clock. Mm, I'll read one more. And then I'm going to call it a night. But Excuse me. The next chapter is called The King's Provider. This is chapter 7. Sam had just um, been scared by a little old lady that came up to his home on the old Gribbly farm. And uh, she made him walk him home. She thinks he lives in town or something. And to get away to escape her, he said he was going to the library. So that's where he went. Excuse me. <sighs> Miss Turner, if you remember, that was the librarian who helped him find um, maps and things so he could find the farm. Miss Turner was glad to see me. I told her I wanted some books on hawks and falcons. She located a few, although there was not much to be had on the subject. We worked all afternoon, and I learned enough. I departed when the library closed. Miss Turner whispered to me as I left, Sam, you need a haircut. I had not seen myself in so long that this had not occurred to me. Gee, I don't have any scissors. She thought a minute, got out her library scissors, and sat me down on the back steps. She did a fine job, and I looked like any other boy who had played hard all day, and who, with a little soap and water after supper, would be going off to bed in a regular house. I didn't get back to my tree that night. The May apples were ripe. I stuffed on those as I went through the woods. They taste like a very sweet banana, and are earthy and a little slippery, but I like them. At the stream, I caught a trout. Everybody thinks a trout is hard to catch because of all the fancy gear and flies and lines sold for trout fishing. But honestly, they are easier to catch than any other fish. They have big mouths and snatch and swallow whole anything they see when they are hungry. With my wooden hook in its mouth, the trout was mine. The trouble is that trout are not hungry when most people have time to fish. I knew they were hungry that evening because the creek was swirling and minnows and everything else were jumping out of the water. When you see that, go fish. You'll get them. I made a fire on a flat boulder in the stream and cooked the trout. I did this so I could watch the sky. I wanted to see the falcon again. I also put the trout head on the hook and dropped it in the pool. A snapping turtle would view a trout head with relish. I waited for the falcon patiently. I didn't have to go anywhere. After an hour or so, I was rewarded. A slender speck came from the valley and glided above the stream. It was still far away when it folded its wings and bombed to the earth. I watched. It arose clumsy and big, carrying food, and winged back to the valley. I sprinted down the stream and made myself a lean-to near some cliffs where I thought the bird had disappeared. Having learned that day that duck hawks prefer to nest on cliffs, I settled for this sight. Early the next morning I got up and dug the tubers of the arrow leaf that grew along the stream bank. I baked these and boiled mussels for breakfast. Then I curled up behind a willow and watched the cliff. The falcons came in from behind me and circled the stream. They had apparently been out hunting before I had gotten up as they were returning with food. This was exciting news. They were feeding young and I was somewhere near the nest. I watched one of them swing into the cliff and disappear. A few minutes later, it winged out empty footed. I marked the spot mentally and said, ha. After splashing across the stream in the shallows, I stood at the bottom of the cliff and wondered how on earth I was going to climb the sheer wall. I wanted a falcon so badly, however, that I dug in with my toes and hands and started up. The first part was easy, it was not too steep. When I thought I was stuck, I found a little ledge and shinnied up to it. It was high, and when I looked down, 
the stream spun, I decided not to look down anymore. I edged up to another ledge and lay down on it to catch my breath. I was shaking from exertion, and I was tired. I looked up to see how much higher I had to go when my hand touched something moist. I pulled it back and saw that it was white. Bird droppings. Then I saw them. Almost where my hand had been sat three fuzzy, whitish-gray birds. Their wide open mouths gave them a startled look. Oh, hello, hello, I said. You are cute. When I spoke, all three blinked at once. All three heads turned and followed my hand as I swung it up towards them. All three watched my hand with open mouths. They were marvelous, I chuckled, but I couldn't reach them. I wormed forward and wham! Something hit my shoulder. It pained. When I turned my head, or I turned my head to see the big female, she had hit me. She winged out, banked, and started back for another strike. Now I was scared. I was sure she would cut me wide open. With sudden nerve, I stood up, stepped forward, and picked up the biggest of the nestlings. The females are bigger than the males. They are the falcons. They are the pride of kings. I tucked her in my sweater and leaned against the cliff, facing the bullet-like dive of the falcon. I threw out my foot as she struck, and the sole of my tennis shoe took the blow. The female was now gathering speed for another attack, and when I say speed, I mean 50 to 60 miles an hour. I could see myself battered and torn laying in the valley below, and I said to myself, Sam Gribbley, you better get down from here like a rabbit. I jumped to the ledge below, found that it was really quite wide, slid on the seat of my pants to the next ledge, and stopped. The hawk apparently couldn't count. She did not know I had a youngster, for she checked her nest, saw the open mouths, and then she forgot me. I scrambled to the riverbed somehow, being very careful not to hurt the hot, fuzzy body that was against my own. However, frightful, as I called her, right then and there, because of the difficulties we had had in getting, getting together, did not think so gently of me. She dug her sharp talons into my skin to brace herself during the bumpy ride to the ground. I stumbled at the stream, placed her in a nest of buttercups, and dropped beside her. I fell asleep. When I awoke, my eyes opened on two gray eyes and in a white strubly head. Small pin feathers were sticking out of the strubly down. Like feathers in an Indian quiver, the big blue beak curled down in a snarl and up in a smile. Oh, frightful, I said. You are a raving beauty. Frightful fluffed her nubby feathers and shook. I picked her up in the cup of my hands and held her under my chin. I stuck my nose in the deep warm fuzz. It smelled dusty and sweet. And there's some pictures of Sam, with Frightful, and more of Little Frightful. Just a little fluffy little bird. Pretty cool. Let's get the focus back. There we go. Wow. I liked that bird. Oh, how I liked that bird from that smelly minute. It was so pleasant to feel the beating life and see the funny little awkward movements of a young thing. The legs pushed out between my feather between my fingers. I gathered them up together with the thrashing wings and tucked the bird in one piece under my chin. I rocked. Frightful, I said. You'll enjoy what we are going to do. I washed my bleeding shoulder in the creek tucked the, thorn thre the torn threads of my sweater back into the hole they had come out of and set out for my tree. That's the end of the chapter. That is exciting. Sam caught a baby peregrine falcon. 
that he's going to try to raise to hunt for him. That is exciting stuff. That is uh, pretty neat. And that's the end for tonight, too. Um, kids, I hope you're enjoying the book. Hope you like the story. And um, if there's anything that you hear us read about that you'd like to try, uh, let me know. And they'll go out in the backyard and give it a shot. Uh, I love you guys. Good night. <laughs>